Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Wednesday, May 18th, we are studying Acts chapter 9, verses 20 to 31. The Lord's conversion of Saul has effect right away. The man who had come to Damascus to arrest people for believing in Jesus now begins to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, the Reverend Dr. Jeff Dukeman. Pastor Dukeman serves at St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Gulfport, Mississippi. Pastor Dukeman, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thank you, Pastor Apple. Good to be here. As we get started this morning, Pastor, let's talk a little bit of context. Help us to to see where this text is situated in the canon and, and in the book of Acts, particularly. Sure. Well, Luke was... Um, widely held to be the author of both Luke and Acts. They were a companion volume, and Luke was the uh, companion of the Apostle Paul. And so there was definitely an influence of Paul on those writings. Um, Matthew, I believe, was the first gospel. It was a very uh, Jewish in, in tone. It showed how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. That was one of its main purposes. And then Luke is the second gospel, then was necessary or needed for Paul and his missionary journeys and his work among the Gentiles. Uh, he felt it was helpful to have a gospel that wasn't as steeped in the Old Testament imagery, although there's plenty of Old Testament, uh, but also could could use Greco-Roman cultural forms to help try to communicate the gospel. And so, for example, there are allusions to things like the, the peace of the Romans or to Homer's Odyssey, especially in all the notions of journey uh, the, the the missionary or the, the travel narrative in the middle of Luke's gospel or three's excuse me Paul's three missionary journeys in the middle of Acts. Uh, there's a mention of Paul being shipwrecked. It reminds you of Odysseus in the Odyssey and uh, and so forth. So, uh, whenever you look at Acts itself, it, it it is helpful to kind of keep the gospel of Luke in mind. And there's kind of a, I believe both books have a three part structure. And there's geography factors in in, 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 a, in a big way. So, for example, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus begins in northern Israel in Galilee, about the first third. And then there's the uh, travel narrative from Galilee in the north to Judea and Jerusalem in the south through Samaria in the middle of Jeru- of, of Israel. And then uh, Jesus and his and his disciples end. In Jerusalem, whereas the book of Acts kind of switches that where Jesus begins in, excuse me, Jesus and the church, the the infant church there begins in Jerusalem and Judea. And then the church slowly spreads. Uh, uh, It's mainly in the historic Israel in the first third of Acts. And then in the middle part of Acts, you have the three missionary journeys of Paul, where he's taking the gospel further and further away. And then the final third of uh, of Acts contains Paul's visit to Rome and all of his his arrest and his trials and so forth. Hmm. So that that provides uh, just kind of an overview of of uh, the, the wider context of of our text, and then we could also look a little bit more kind of within Acts itself. Uh, sure, go go ahead because I mean you you've kind of laid out for us the geographic movement that we see in the book of Acts and and we've seen already in the last couple of chapters, particularly in chapter eight, the spread to Samaria and then to the Ethiopian eunuch. Where do we find ourselves in that in that movement of the gospel in the book of Acts? Sure. Well, our text from Acts nine it falls in that what I call the first third or so of Acts before Paul's three missionary journeys. And I think there's about three parts there as well. So the first seven chapters approximately have the church mainly focused in Jerusalem. And then from Acts 1 
excuse me, Acts 8, 1 through 9, 31, which is where our text falls from uh, Acts 9, 20 to 31, we see that the church is, is expanding and it spreads throughout Judea and Samaria and even Galilee. So it's not just in Judea anymore. Now it's also in Samaria and Galilee. Famous, you know, familiar things from the Gospel of Luke. Again, that was the, the main places, Galilee and Samaria. So we're starting to get spread away from uh, just Jerusalem. And then at the end of that kind of first third of, of Acts, you have uh, a, a shift in Acts 9, 32, until up to chapter 13, to a focus on Peter. It's kind of like his uh, his swan song, if you will, where where Peter and the other apostles kind of start to recede from view. So, and we can talk about that a little bit more maybe whenever we look closer at the text. But uh, we see uh, the apostle John killed in that section, and we see Peter's life was in danger as well, but he is miraculously saved by God. It's, it's kind of like a death and resurrection of Peter, which is kind of fitting as, as Peter is kind of passing the baton to Paul for his missionary journeys. We see some failures of Peter as he uh, shows favoritism to uh, the Jewish Christians over the Gen- Gentile Christians, um, but, but we also see this suffering of Peter under the gospel uh, for the sake of the gospel and being rescued by God. And so we're, we're kind of in the middle of that, that first third, and it's when the, the church is spreading uh, now away from just Jerusalem to uh, Judea, excuse me, to Samaria, especially Samaria, but also to Galilee. So, and well, uh, and, yes. and so then how does, cause, cause you mentioned Peter is going to come back into view after our text today, the text that we pick up tomorrow, Peter comes back and he will begin to be the primary human character within the book of acts yet again, as he was in the first several chapters. We've got a bit of an interlude here though. And Saul has taken center stage. How does, and of course he's going to become the primary human actor later in the book, as you've already indicated, how does his his conversion and then the aftermath that we see today, how does that function within this section? Yeah, I, I would. Um, <clears throat> one of my main thoughts in connection with this text is that Paul Paul um, is still quite passive relative to other figures on the scene. And so if we kind of zero in on this section where uh, the, the gospel and the church are spreading beyond Judea up into Samaria and Galilee. That's, uh, again, Acts 8.1 through um, 9.31. There's, there's some literary devices that kind of show what's going on there, that, that kind of mark that section off. So in, in both 8.1 at the beginning and at uh, 9.29 through 31, we can see summary statements that involve the, also involve the Apostle Paul, and it kind of marks off that section uh, as, as one unit. And so, like I say, and, and I'll just read them really quickly here. In eight one, it says, "And Saul approved of his, that is Stephen's execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles." So there we see that mention of Samaria is coming into view because of this persecution that's driving uh, the apostles or, or the, the church um, away from Jerusalem. And then at the end of the section, in, in nine twenty nine through thirty one, we hear. And Paul spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit and multiplying. Mm-hmm. So there again, we have a mention of Paul and we have uh, this, this status of the church being summarized that is now moved beyond just Judea into Samaria and Galilee. And so within this section, we, we have the, the conversion of Paul and, and uh, just before our text and also some in, initial ministry of Paul. But, but I would argue that still more, more prominent is the, the work of, of Philip, actually. And so, for example, at the, uh, the beginning of Acts 8, we see that Philip proclaims Christ in Samaria. And then a little later, towards the end of chapter 8, we see, so he's that's kind of north of, of Judea. And then the second half, or later in chapter 8, we have Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and that was down in Gaza to the south, kind of the southwest of, of Judea. And so we, we see that the gospel spreading, but Philip is the one who's especially prominent. And then right on the heels of that, that's when you have the conversion of Saul at the beginning of chapter nine. So 
again, it's as if um, the apostles are providing a foundation. That's that's the context that this conversion comes in. The, as the gospel is spreading, they're the lead actors, and then Saul initially is actually working against it, obviously, as he's uh, going to Damascus to to try to arrest and, and kill uh, the, the Christians there. Hmm. Um, yeah, should I, should I keep going? Or, sure, go, yeah, no, go, go ahead, keep going. I don't want to interrupt your, I hate to interrupt a train of thought, so keep, keep taking us <laughs> through it. Okay, sure. So um, another kind of geographical hint uh, or context uh, for this, as we see the gospel spreading uh, to Samaria and also to Galilee, is, um, is kind of Paul's movement. Paul is moving from, or Saul at that time, was moving from Jerusalem uh, up to Damascus, which would have been in Syria. And to get there, he most likely would roughly go through Galilee. And, um, and so later, when we look at our text, we'll be able to see that, um, that Paul was doing ministry, initial ministry, both in Damascus and in Jerusalem. And so we see just an initial glimpse of Paul being an apostle to the Gentiles as he's, as he's going to be in Galilee where the, uh, or, or traveling through there and going beyond there somewhat uh, with the gospel. So kind of accompanying the work of Philip, but, but much more, much weaker at this point, I would, I would argue mm-hmm. still, still kind of like a, 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 a being mentored, if you will, or he's playing second fiddle to use a, a bad term, but I can't think of another one. Uh, so that's, that's the, uh, the basic context is, you know, the first seven chapters, you have the apostles, and especially Peter, and to a lesser extent, John, and um, he's starting to have some some uh, second generation, or uh, uh, like the seven uh, deacons, uh, Stephen, for example, the ministry started to expand. Uh, but then, but then in eight and nine, we see the gospels amidst persecution going in Judea, excuse me, beyond Judea to Samaria, and um, in Galilee, and then after this section, uh, before the Paul's, Paul's three missionary journeys, we have uh, Peter's, Peter's work, and uh, he was not just suffering, but he also was helping to lead the charge or lead the church to expand to Antioch, so even further away than Samaria and Galilee. It's like, it's like dropping a pond into a, uh, into a lake. That, the, pond, the, the middle, you have concentric circles getting wider and wider, mm-hmm. and you have Jerusalem at the center and Judea, and then he goes out to Samaria and Galilee, and then further and further into the Roman empire with Paul's missionary journeys. Right. And that, that goes back to the way Jesus spoke to his apostles before he ascended, that they would be witnesses there in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And you're starting to see those ripples from the, the rock dropped in the pond going to that second and, and even into the, the third ripple that Jesus mentions there. And I think one of the, the nice things about the way you've situated this text for us structurally within the book of acts particularly seeing how in eight verse one you have saul mentioned and then again at the end of our section today one just to notice the huge transition that the lord has worked through the conversion of saul that at the beginning of eight he was ready to go and arrest more christians and now here at the end of nine because of what the lord has done there's actually peace within the church that the lord has worked a a resolution through to the attack against his church both by the spread of the gospel through the work of philip and also through this conversion of of saul that now leads to this peace and then also just to, to point out too that even as saul does begin ministry in the text that we'll read today he's not yet the the main player in the book of acts this this ties very well into the way luke often speaks in the book of acts he introduces someone and he's done this with saul already he introduces him at the beginning so that he can talk more about him later we're going to encounter one of those very figures in this text a guy by the name of barnabas who was mentioned Mm -hmm. by luke already and now becomes a, a larger player in the book of acts and will continue and so you see how luke does that and I, I suppose if we can make a theological point about that is just to, to notice how when the Lord works in the life of, of someone, you may not recognize it at, at the moment. Like, well, what? That doesn't seem all that significant that Barnabas was there in Acts chapter four. But now the Lord's going to make use of him. And of course, Saul is going to be maybe the biggest example. But just to, to notice how the Lord works in the lives of people, it doesn't seem like a lot at the beginning, but but he will produce a harvest. He does bring the fruit to his work. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm reminded of the, the growth parables, like in Matthew yeah. 13, where like a mustard seed, it's a, it's a tiny seed that's you know, it's after the parable of the sower, whenever uh, Jesus encourages his disciples to, to sow the seed abundantly. And uh, some of those seeds will, 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 catch, will take root in good soil and and grow into to things that are much larger. It will greatly multiply that effort. So, hmm. um, absolutely. All right. Well, let's go ahead and, and take a look at this text. Again, we are in Acts 9, picking up at verse 20. Paul's there with the disciples in Damascus, and the text begins in verse 20. And immediately he, Saul, proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied." That's our text for today. That's Acts 9, verses 20 to 31. Now, Pastor Dukeman, the just a, a reminder of the context, what we read in verse 20 is just the complete opposite of how the chapter began. When Saul was on his way to Damascus, he was breathing threats and murder against the Lord's disciples. And now, his, and it's not quite the same language, but he's, he's proclaiming Jesus <laughs> quite the opposite. He's the son of God. Just the, the complete reversal of what has happened in Saul, the conversion that's happened is, is utterly amazing. Yeah, absolutely. As, as you were, as you've been talking, um, one of the things we were kind of talking about geography, my mind was kind of wandering to, um, we just got out done with, with good Friday and Easter, obviously. And we look in the gospel of Luke, it's like Jerusalem is the place where the prophets go to die. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the place of persecution of Jesus and his, and his people. And, and yet, and that, that holds true all the way up through the cross, but then it's as if something kind of flips with the cross. It's the uh, Jerusalem is transformed from this old Jerusalem that, that is, that puts Jesus to death. And especially the, you know, the Sanhedrin, the, the great council of, of the Jews uh, is especially tied to for historically to who put Jesus to death there. And their their center of power was in Jerusalem. But then after the cross, uh, at the verse you you quoted from Luke a little earlier, where where Jesus talks about how the gospel will be proclaimed uh, beginning in Jerusalem, and so um, I, I, it reminds you that the empty tomb itself it, it's a place associated with death, all the ultimate place associated with death, but it's transformed to become a place of life. Hmm. And um, that's kind of what you see um, in the beginning of Acts. Uh, even before Saul, you, you have uh, some of, even you know, while the the uh, the Sanhedrin or some of the chief priests and uh, and scribes and so forth were still persecuting the church, just as they persecuted Jesus. There were some that were coming to believe, and so you see that transformation from this this old Jerusalem to the new Jerusalem, and and that's that's kind of what that's that's what you see. Uh, with uh, with or you see it also after the cross as well, um, with uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a member of the council, uh, and now he's you know tied with this with with, with being a disciple, um, and uh, and then when you come to, to Saul, you have the same thing. You have this this uh, as you, you say the stark transformation of of Paul, who's murdering, seeking to murder um, the uh, the Christians. He'd already oversaw overseen the stoning of Stephen 
and and now he's he's attempting to to further murder Christians and, and going even going to great lengths to do it. You know, just as the church is trying to spread away from Jerusalem, Saul's trying to stop it by going uh, away from Jerusalem to, to kill Christians that are that are spreading. Hmm. Um, and, and then, but he had, but then uh, this this uh, from from darkness to light. You know, Paul being blinded and seeing Jesus in heaven, the resurrected Lord, uh, crucified and risen Lord. Uh, and after seeing him, you know, he's blinded, uh, kind of symbolic of of his uh, of his his dark state of of uh, persecuting the church. And then he's uh, he's converted. And again, that's that's um, what again makes me think of Paul as a little more passive in this place because there's there's this focus on what God is doing for him. That he's he's moving him from darkness to light. He's converting him from unbelief to belief. Hmm. And then uh, and then that sets the stage for our text where. Where he does a little bit of ministry and showing the spirit is within him and so forth and it's foreshadowing what he's going to do later on but but the heart of it is is that uh, what god is doing for him that he's he's moving him from darkness to light uh, he's converting him uh, and that's it's by 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 grace by god's great love and grace yeah and and certainly it's not a, a not a human thing uh, because the the people who listen to saul at this point and this is one of the themes that that shows up more than once in this text they're uh, at the very least scratching their heads about what this guy is saying as they say, wait a second <laughs> we know why you came here we know what you've done and now you're talking completely differently uh, Talk, talk a little bit about the reaction that Saul receives first, just there in Damascus, as he begins to proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. Sure. Um, whenever I look at, he does ministry basically in two places. First, in Damascus after you know after he is baptized, um, and then, and, and there is this confusion as you as you mentioned. As you can get it, and I love how you tied that to to God's grace, where human understanding just can't can't fathom it. Uh, and even sometimes as Christians, we we have to just marvel at, at the ways God is working. We have to just uh, watch Him, and 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 we'll under, He'll help us to understand it later. But that but that He's His ways are above our ways. But then also you have uh, some of the some of the Jew Jewish leaders uh, starting to persecute Saul uh, as he is proclaiming the gospel here in Damascus, and. Um, yeah, as it says in verse 23, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. Mm-hmm. And then it has him escaping through the through the hole in the, through an opening in the wall. So, um, it, again, you have that theme of that was from the end of Luke's gospel, where it's mainly the the Jewish power, the Jewish Sanhedrin. Mm-hmm. They're the ones that are that are really um, persecuting the church. And that's not to be anti-Semitic, obviously. Um, that was that was for that time and place. You know, from the time of basically Emperor Nero, probably onwards, it will never be never be that way again. You know, uh, it would be other people who would just persecute the church, um, and it would be the Jews who would be persecuted, like the Christians and the Jews before, prior to this time had been persecuted significantly. So it's it's not being anti-Semitic, it's, but it's it's just telling that story and it's, it's historically accurate at that time. Um, there was this resistance. And so Paul would often uh, later on first do ministry among Jews in a given place. And then uh, if he was rejected, then he would go to the Gentiles. And so we see that here in Damascus. And then we're going to see it again in Jerusalem as well. One of the things that, that strikes me here is maybe a little of a poetic irony in, in the way that Saul is described here. Similarly to what happened with Stephen, particularly, you know, verse 22, how Saul is increasing in strength and he's confounding the people to whom he's speaking, much like Stephen, when he would speak to the Sanhedrin, they, they couldn't dispute against him. And, and so what do they do? Well, they, they do end up killing him there. Saul doesn't end up dead at this point, but the reaction is the same. And there's a, a, I don't know, just a bit of irony, I suppose, there. And again, this is the Lord at work doing his, his work, transforming by his grace but how Saul went from the one who had approved of Stephen's death now to actually being in the same place Stephen was in proclaiming that Jesus is the Christ to the point that people are are ready to kill him. Uh, again, it's the way that the Lord works here is uh, I, I find myself smiling at least a little bit at the irony, but then marveling at the grace of God in it. Absolutely. And uh, that's a great connection with uh, with Stephen. And I had, I had thought of another one as well, 
um, if we're thinking of Saul early on, very early on, or the very beginning of his life of faith, it, it harkens back in my mind to the beginning of Luke's, Luke's gospel itself, where there's some similar language uh, for, for Jesus himself and kind of drawing on, on Samuel from the Old Testament. Um, whenever it talks about Samuel as a, uh, as a, a youthful priest and uh, uh, what was the, the other sons of Eli were, were not good priests. But, but, but Samuel, nevertheless, uh, kind of grew in wisdom and stature and something, something along that lines. And we see that same kind of language used of Jesus. So, for example, after his dedication, after the dedication of the temple, when Jesus was 40 days old, we hear, And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And then again, in Luke 2.52, this is whenever Jesus was in the temple at age 12, and uh, he had been left behind and was disputing and and discussing things with uh, the teachers in the temple. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And uh, whenever you whenever you mentioned that about kind of a bewildered response, that it's kind of what you think of too with, with Jesus. I mean, you see, first of all, I mean, you, you remember Jesus, Jesus was a youth with uh, Simeon and Anna. Hmm. You know, you see a little bit of that, but then especially when he's in the temple, um, they were kind of amazed at uh, at his great understanding, even at the age of twelve. You know how how can this twelve year old be be have such wisdom? Uh, and, the, and the answer was because because God was with him. You know, so it was just an early glimpse into Jesus's future. Um, he hadn't been ordained to the ministry yet. That would happen to his at his at his baptism, and not until he's thirty years old. But there were already signs of it very early on. Early on, because uh, God had created faith in him and had given him His Spirit, and uh, and was 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 going had plans to use him for His purposes. And, and so too here with with Saul. Saul is is growing in wisdom, and it and it kind of draws perplex people around are somewhat perplexed at uh, at this. Mm, yeah. So already, even right after his conversion, we see Saul incorporated into the life of the Lord, mirroring the life of the Lord, as we've been seeing for the early church throughout the Book of Acts. And we're going to keep looking at this text on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're looking at Acts nine with Pastor Jeff Dukeman. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, May 18th. We're studying Acts chapter 9, verses 20 to 31 with Pastor Jeff Dukeman. He serves at St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Gulfport, Mississippi. Pastor Dukeman, one of the things that, that does strike me about Saul at this point, as you mentioned, although he is beginning to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not yet the main character within the book of acts. And he does play this, you know, a a more minor role at this point. And, and the reaction that he receives from people, even those who end up listening is still, who is this guy? We thought he was on the other side. It, It is reminiscent to me of the way that Paul will speak in his own epistles about the, about the qualifications for those who would be in the office of the ministry, that they should not be a recent convert. And I think Paul's experience, even as an apostle, is testimony to the wisdom of that that there there is something too about letting the Lord work in in your life as a as a you know as a convert before just jumping right into the office of the ministry and all the public proclamation. I think the example of of Saul here again gives testimony to the wisdom of those words. Sure, yeah, you, you know a lot of Paul's epistles have a, a defense of his apostleship that he was an apostle. Uh, in a different way from the 12 yeah. and yet, or, or the apostle James, you know, Jesus's brother, uh, but he was an apostle just as much as they were. And so even though he hadn't been with 
Jesus throughout all of his life, he had had the special appearance of the resurrected Lord Jesus to him from the sky uh, and, 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 and this remarkable uh, change that, that, he, that Jesus affected in him. And then we also, I think what comes to mind here is, is also that we know that, that Paul went into the desert, I believe, for, for three years. And then it was, um, he had, a, I think it was his first appearance in Jerusalem. And then it was another 14 years before he came back uh, again to Jerusalem. And that was all before his first missionary journey. And so you're looking at, uh, you know, 17 years. And, and Paul sometimes talks about how he, he didn't receive his apostleship uh, uh, from the twelve. Uh, but but God was somehow working in this in this time whenever He was in the desert and whenever He was uh, away from Jerusalem, God was was working with 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 Paul uh, and was and was fanning into flame uh, the seeds that were planted there whenever He was He was converted and did this initial ministry. Uh, God is God Himself is working and through and through His church, obviously too. Wherever whenever Paul or was it Tarsus or or Antioch or wherever wherever He was was at, uh, God would be working and preparing Paul uh, for this for this work of an apostle. I'm glad you mentioned the the timeline that we get. I believe that's in chapter one of Galatians where Paul speaks about some of those, those timeline. And it, it seems that there's probably an overlap with what happens here in, in Acts chapter nine, although exactly how that, that works out is, is not always precisely possible to, to figure out exactly, but it does seem like as you move the, as the text moves into to verse 26, after Paul escapes from the persecution that's there in Damascus, he, he goes to Jerusalem that perhaps there's some, some time gaps here that Luke doesn't indicate as precisely as, as he might, that it might be out after a while before he comes to Jerusalem. And then later, you know, when he goes to, to Caesarea and then to Tarsus, that there's some, there's some gaps of time that may be there that say we learn from that, what Paul says in the first chapter of Galatians. So, but when, when he goes to Jerusalem, then uh, talk a little bit about the reception he receives there and the role that Barnabas plays in, in helping him to be received by the apostles in Jerusalem. Sure. Yeah. His, his re- reception is, is in many ways similar to what he, to his reception in, um, in Damascus as, as, as he begins to do ministry and that there's some events before that, but, but as he do, begins to do ministry, he begins to, to proclaim Jesus uh, that there were, there were some some Jews who were again persecuting him, and um, it says that he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. And um, the Hellenists, I I did a little bit of research on that, and Strong's Concordance uh, talks about them as as Jews who only knew Greek; they didn't know Aramaic or or Hebrew. So there might be other kind of um, you know Greek speak. I think probably about everybody spoke Greek at that time, and there but there have been some. Some um, Jews, especially in this area, they would speak both Greek as well as Aramaic Hebrew. But these would have been uh, more people who probably were coming from out of town, honestly. Uh, if you were there in Judea, you probably were immersed in, in Aramaic and Hebrew, too. But uh, these were, were uh, Jews who only knew Greek. But uh, Paul was – I think maybe that does foreshadow some things later on, too, as, as Paul encounters similar – uh, types of people as he goes away from, you know, goes into the, the various regions of the, the Roman Empire, away from Jerusalem and maybe uh, thorough, you know, quite Hellenized Jews in those you know, places like Corinth and so forth. Um, so again, maybe some foreshadowing there. But uh, but these Hellenists, they were seeking to kill him. And that's when the brothers uh, had to, to uh, send him off to Caesarea and then off to, to Tarsus, to his hometown. So So just as there was kind of this movement from Jew to Gentile, that we saw in Damascus, there was the same kind of movement is present in uh, Jerusalem as well, and it'll be present uh, explicitly later on in Acts as well. Um, but but even before that, before he begins his ministry, he first encounters the uh, disciples themselves and the apostles, and they, at first they were very skeptical. Uh, they were they, they were afraid of him. Uh, because th- they did not believe he was this, he was a disciple. So mm. the last time they saw him in Jerusalem, That's right. he was off to Damascus. First of all, he had been killing people like Stephen in Jerusalem, yeah. and they knew he was going off uh, after talking to the chief priests and getting authorization to go off to Damascus to kill Christians there too. 
So that was the last time they saw him. And now all of a sudden here he is. And, and, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a believer now. And they might've been thinking, sure, that's a nice plot. You know, yeah. uh, say you're a, say you're a Christian and then you infiltrate us so you can kill us easier, you know? So it, it, it's a natural reaction for them to be, be skeptical. But, um, but, but then, as you mentioned, Barnabas uh, does vouch for, for uh, Paul and explains how, what had happened on, on how Paul, what had happened to him as, as he was on the way to Damascus and how he had been converted and baptized and had proclaimed Jesus there in Damascus. And as you mentioned a little earlier, Barnabas had, uh, had first been introduced in Acts and Acts 4, whenever it talks about this, this early group of Christians huddling together, uh, you know, the persecution surrounding them, and they had everything in common because it was a dire kind of emergency circumstance. And, and, it, and Barnabas is said to have sold a field to help provide money uh, and provisions for this church as they were uh, huddling together. So Barnabas, had, as you said, he, he was introduced earlier because he's going he's gonna to be prominent later in the text. And then we, we find uh, in Paul's first missionary journey, Barnabas is, is there side by side with Paul all along, suffering with Paul and so forth. And then there'll be kind of a parting of ways with the second missionary journey hmm. as there's a, a pretty sharp dispute, as it says, over, over Mark, because uh, Mark kind of— uh, the, kind of left Paul and Barnabas during the first missionary journey, and uh, that, I believe that's the same Mark that wrote our gospel and would be yeah. a companion to Peter. But but uh, so so anyway, uh, Barnabas ha- had shown his qualifications before, and uh, and this is again is introducing him as one who later on again down the road he and he and Paul together are going to do tremendous things in that first first journey. Right. Yeah, we see the the relationship between Paul and Barnabas develop again after that once Peter kind of recedes into the background, Paul takes center stage, Barnabas comes back again. And it's it's striking here in, in Acts 9 how this is now the second time Barnabas has shown up. How particularly here he lives up to the name that he was given. It, in Acts 4:36 it says that Joseph was given this name Barnabas by the apostles, and that names mean that name means son of encouragement. To see Barnabas taking that role here, I think I mean he's he's living up to the name that the apostles gave him in this role of encouragement to the church to yes receive Saul as a brother because that's who he really is now. The Lord has been at work, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday with the uh, when Ananias goes to Saul and the first word that he says to him is brother Saul. That's now the encouragement of Barnabas to the whole church there in Jerusalem. Here is our brother. Let's receive him as, as such that, I mean, that's, that's really important for us as, as Christians still to, to welcome those who have been brought to faith as brothers, as sisters in the faith. This is just a, a wonderful thing. Sure. Yeah. I, it, it's uh, again, it's, it's just marvelous to see how God um, long before, you know, who would have dreamed that Saul was going to be doing what he was going to do later in Acts. Uh, but but God knew, and God was preparing the way for him. And so I, I see it as a pretty prominent theme, in, like in the Gospel of, of Luke again, and the other Gospels as well, but you see John the Baptist as a forerunner of Jesus. And like in, in the, the Gospel of John, it says that John the Baptist was a man sent by God. Hmm. So you, God was dealing with John the Baptist and helping him to be the forerunner. And that's what you see quite a bit in especially Luke 1. Uh, as a forerunner of Jesus, um, uh, preparing the way for him, and it was as if uh, Jesus early on could could look to, uh, to for leadership to John the Baptist because God had sent him for that purpose and to fill that office that had been prophesied in the Old Testament. And so too, in here in, in Acts, you seem to have uh, the apostles and and others as sorts of forerunners of Paul. And uh, especially somebody like Barnabas, uh, you know, obviously the, the apostles had a certain centrality throughout this part. Uh, so they're more than just forerunners, but especially somebody like Barnabas, it's, it's like he's, he's preparing the way uh, for, for Saul. And uh, when he's first mentioned, like you said, he was the right man for the job. He, his name meant son of encouragement. And uh, that's exactly what he would do. Uh, that's, that's a great point that whenever, uh, whenever Paul needed um, to, to be supported, whenever the, the apostles were questioning him, uh, this sort of forerunner, Barnabas, uh, God had put put him there in place 
to help prepare the way for him. Hmm. Now, as you mentioned, when he is received then there in Jerusalem, he begins to preach already, particularly among the Hellenists, those who whose language, they were Jews, but their language is, is primarily Greek. And I think part of that, too, is, is their culture is primarily Greek as well, that they've, they've adopted a lot of those Greek cultural backgrounds. Uh, we, we saw earlier in Acts, in Acts chapter 6, there was a dispute among the, the widows in Jerusalem because the, the Hellenist ones felt like they were being neglected and, and probably were over those who are more of the, the Hebrew background and, and retain that language and culture. So th- again, we, we see that again. And I think, and I, you, I think you pointed this out, Pastor Dukeman, that you see a little bit of, of the pattern that Paul will establish later here already in that he often speaks first to Jews and then to Gentiles. And that becomes very prominent on his missionary journeys, but it looks like that the stage is already being set here in his early ministry at the beginning stages. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's a great, uh, that, that former mention of, of Hellenists being neglected. That's a, that's a, that's a, a great point. And it kind of points to the kind of the need. There's, there's a need for Paul. That's part of this story. And uh, you can see that especially with, with Peter, how Peter was showing favoritism to the, 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 the Jewish Christians more than the, the more uh, Hellenistic Christians. Uh, to the point, and you know, in Galatians, it, it, Paul use, Paul even uses pretty strong language there. This is more diplomatic in, in his history book and in, in Acts, but in uh, in Galatians, it talks about Paul opposing Peter to his face. You know, and uh, even in Acts, you know, God had to intervene and and have the uh, is it, in a couple chapters later and had to have the sheet descend with the animals on it uh, and, and telling Peter to eat them and 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 ensuring him no what what God has made. They were unclean animals according to the Jewish uh, ceremonial laws, but God said, "Don't don't call what I've made clean unclean." Mm. And so, so there is this need. We we see that uh, that there's a need for ministry among the among the more Hellenistic Christians and the more Hellenistic people, um, and that there was this um, this Jewish background of the apostles, and that even among the apostles themselves, they could show favoritism. To, to Jewish uh, people uh, at times. And so, again, that's kind of paving the way for Paul. You know, at one point, Paul is uh, Paul's called the apostle to the Gentiles, and there was, there was this need for, for someone like Paul to go and be this missionary among these Gentile people to really focus on them. Hmm. I mean, it's always striking to me with, with Paul how he, he is so at home in both places, how, how he can be perfectly conversant with the Old Testament scriptures and and go into a synagogue and nobody can argue against him because he knows it so well. And then on the other hand, and, and not that these Hellenists are necessarily Gentiles, They're, they are likely Jews who, who have maybe, again, more of that Greek flavor to their lifestyle, but he's, he's just at home in both places. And that's one of the marvelous things about how the Lord chose this man to, to make his apostle that, I mean, he knew precisely what he was doing and, and picked the right guy for the job. And, and again, not because there's something inherent in Paul, but because this is the Lord's grace at work through this man who, who is able to, to speak the Lord's word by the Lord's grace it, to anybody he encountered. It's, it's a marvelous thing to, to see the grace of God accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And what, what comes to my mind there is, is just where Paul is from being from Tarsus. Sure. It's likely that that the other apostles, I mean, they're they're introduced as being in Galilee, but Paul's way over in you know in, in Galatia and in, in, uh, I think it's where where Tarsus is up there on the north shore of the the, the uh, Mediterranean Sea. So he's he's from somewhere else. Uh, you know, he would have been more likely familiar with, with Hellenistic Jews and Hellenistic uh, Hellenistic Hellenistic culture away from away from Israel. And so that, that would uh, again, it's not that. Uh, that made him qualified to be to be a, a Christian, obviously, but but God could convert him and then uh, use some of those some of those experiences uh, for His purposes. Hmm. Now, and and that's where the the account of Paul at this point is left off when they find out that they're these Hellenists are wanting to kill him in Jerusalem. They the brothers learn of it. They whisk Paul away to Caesarea and then finally to Tarsus. And that's where at least for a time Luke is going to step aside from the story of of Paul and focus in again on what the Lord is doing through Peter and the way again the gospel is going to to grow. Now as our text concludes in verse thirty one 
and we get one of these summary statements that Luke has been providing pretty much along the way to remind us how the word of the Lord is growing in the early church. So uh, what do we need to, to see in that summary statement he gives us in verse 31 of our text today? Yeah, I, I think, uh, again, it kind of brings this little unit to a close, and it speaks of the church growing. And mm. again, that's something that is is the Spirit's work, and he involves us in it, but it's larger than us. And so uh, that, that's one of the one of the, uh, the main lessons here, I think, um, both God's grace and converting Paul, but then also that there was this larger church that Paul uh, was a part of. He, the church didn't start with Paul, but he was walking, he was stepping into an existing church just as we all have. And so uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the Lord's Prayer, kind of the first half of that prayer. You're acknowledging all of God's work in, uh, in, in all that history and all those places in the world that where we haven't stepped foot god's prepared the way for us and then that's the foundation when we confess and praise god for doing those things we then have confidence and boldness to to pray that second half of the prayer where we keep on saying us uh, give us this day our daily bread just as you have uh brought about this your kingdom has come your kingdom has grown through through your your power and and love in in all these different places in history so too now because of that uh, amidst sinful people, um, amid, amidst us sinful people now, you'll continue to do the same thing, and, and that God wants to involve us in that larger growth of his kingdom that he's been working for for ages b- before us. Hmm. I, I love the connection to the to the Lord's Prayer, Pastor Dukeman. The other thing that, that stands out to me in verse 31 is just the way that the that Luke writes about the, the multiplication is that the church was walking both in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, those those two way of ways of speaking, the, the fear of the Lord, that's a very Old Testament way of, of speaking. The comfort of the Holy Spirit reminds of some of those promises that Jesus made to his his disciples. I'm thinking particularly of what he says in the, the upper room on Monday, Thursday, as, as John records it in John, what, 14 to, to 17. Those, those two things that, that Luke mentions there, the, the fear of the Lord, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, that's the way that the Lord is multiplying his church. Th- those two ways of speaking, I think, just add uh, a flavor to this this summary statement that maybe Luke, he's adding here to some of the ways he's spoken in the past about the word of the Lord growing and multiplying. Yeah, I, I think it's a great point. Um, it, it's as if it, absolutely making uh, that, that notion of standing in awe or fearing the Lord was a very uh, very Old Testament way of, of speaking about our relationship with God. But then, like you say, you have this, this the comforter in, in the last, uh, Jesus' last sermon, his farewell discourse in John. It's as if you have this kind of new way of the Spirit working. You know, the Spirit's now going to testify not just what God has done in the Old Testament, but to what Jesus himself, he'll lead us in, into to all truth, and he'll bring to mind everything that Jesus had taught his disciples and, dis- and taught us. So I think that's a, I hadn't noticed that before, but I think that's absolutely right on key that the God is bringing multiplication both amongst Jews and Gentiles and, and maybe putting it that way in a, in a more Old Testament way and in, um, and in, in a, a way that, that's more closely tied to the, to the life of Jesus, that um, it's all coming together as the, the church is, is growing and there's this harmony between the people of old and the Old Testament and the New Testament. As, uh, as God is bringing things to fulfillment and building on that foundation from the Old Testament. Well, and, and as you said, I think both of those ways of speaking emphasize the, the work of the Lord within the church, that just as Paul was not the one who started the church, but came into the church by the Lord's grace, so the church continues to grow by the work of the Lord as he brings people to the fear of him and as he comforts that church through the work of his Holy Spirit in the word. It, it emphasizes, we've, we've mentioned this several times as we've gone through the book of Acts, that yes, it is the acts of the apostles, but the acts of the Holy Spirit spirit through the word that's what's driving the church continuing the the church's multiplication as, as luke writes here pastor duke I mean, we got about five minutes here as, as we reflect on what's what's a very historical text it tells us about paul's early ministry after he is converted as we reflect on the, the history that's there in the text how do we make use of it as christians what does this text do for us as we think about our lives as as the disciples of the lord in 2022 
Yeah, I, I think um, to answer that question, I'd just go back real quickly to that structure of Luke. There being three parts, um, I, I tend to see three parts in in each of the Gospels as well. Um, there's this movement from from God the Father and and baptism to vocation and the Holy Spirit, and then with and then like in the Gospels, you got Holy Week and um, an emphasis on the Son. Uh, if the Father is the one especially associated with being the creator of the world, the beginning of the story, the Son is the one who completes the story. And, those, and they work together. That was part of God's plan for the Father and Son to, to work together that way in the overall scope of history, but then also in smaller stories in our own lives and, and smaller stories of the, of the church's existence. And so being in that, that first third, if you will, of Acts, it especially, I believe, points to to god's grace you know as, as we were just talking about in that summary statement about uh, is the fear of the lord and the comfort of, it's 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 god's doing you know paul can't paul can't claim that growth for himself it was that growth was already happening and he just kind of carried along in the stream he'll, and he'll have his own important role to play and that's, that's god's grace that he involves us in that that stream as well um and so we don't belittle our own vocations in the spirit but we don't we also are quick to recognize that we're only able to do that because God has, has converted us. God has equipped us. And so there's, there's a strong sense of like what I would call a, a baptismal discipleship here that uh, that's focusing on God's grace and, and making Paul a believer whenever he was an unbeliever. And, and in the process, he, he's, he's promising to sustain his faith. He's promising uh, to, 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 to help uh, Paul to give Paul nourishment in the larger church that that he has set up in the world, and then he by if, by further grace he's also going to use Paul uh, to to do vocation through in the power of the Holy Spirit. That just as others are serving Paul here uh, through God's grace, Paul's also going to help uh, other people through the same the power of the same Spirit. That he's going to be to help that church grow. And that's that's what we do as well. There are so many that, that preceded us. We can't claim to have created the church, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're placed into this enormous church on earth. And yet, and that's all by grace, uh, it, you know, God's converting us and putting us in this church to take care of us. And yet God further shows his love for us that he, he genuinely uses our vocations, just as he would use Paul's in his three missionary journeys, that, that he equips us to go out and, and be part of that process of bringing the gospel to other people. So we become indispensable parts of God's working as well. Uh, so that, those are a couple of thoughts that come to my mind that uh, it recalls our where we came from, that uh, we we all have been made members of God's family and and equipped with the Holy Spirit long ago whenever we were converted, uh, but then but then God is with us and, and works through us and, and and He prepares us for for all of our new vocations each you know, each day or each new project or each new relationship. Uh, God is there as the foundation. There's a newness and a difficulty to it those things often that, that can overwhelm us or, or intimidate us. But, but God promises just as he started our fit Christian faith, he's also going to be with us as we begin these new chapters in our lives uh, to, 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 to maintain our faith and also to equip us uh, and to, in the course of time, go out there and do his will uh, in the kingdom. Yeah, and then he brings it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Jeff Dukeman is pastor at St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Gulfport, Mississippi, helping us today with Acts chapter 9, verses 20 to 31. Pastor Dukeman, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you very much, Pastor Apple. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Acts chapter 9, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or use the open mic feature on the app to send a message to us. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.